Today, we're going to look at what you should never say to an investor. Things that will make them walk away. Investment killing statements. Yes, we're going to dig into those investment killing statements. This is Raw Startup. We have a full panel of experienced investors. Investors have done hundreds of investments each and walked away from thousands. Be aware though, this is a tough panel of investors. I, I tend to walk away. And if it doesn't work, then, then we can't invest. Maybe I should not be considering investing in the startup in the first place. A single point of failure is something I never want to invest in. Damn, this could get interesting. You might already have lost an investment because of something that's in this video. Well, at least stick around so it won't happen in the future. With the panel, we did a big brainstorm. Then we voted to find the worst walk away statements. So here we are, the nine things you should never say to an investor. Let's get going. Number nine, I'm a sole founder and I don't need a strong team. Most investors do prefer two or three co-founders, but they'll also back a fantastic solo founder. However, they will not back people that think they don't need a team. They will not back people that think they can do everything for themselves. Building a startup is a team sport. No matter what they come to the table with, I have all this experience, that's great, but you still need to have a strong team around you. So I think a single point of failure is something I never want to invest in. Yes, you can be a brilliant founder, but I mean, building business is a team sport, I think. And the, the sooner you realize that, the better. Some people are not capable of doing that. Even the founders uh, that decide to go solo, because going solo and uh, not building a team or denying the necessity to build a complementary team, these are different things. Number eight, my founder and I just met a few months ago. My co-founder at Vivino, Thais, and I have built businesses for the past 20 years. That is an incredible strength. I look for a team. And if the team just met, that makes me a little bit nervous as well. If they know each other for a while, they've gone to school, they've grown up together, they've got this relationship, maybe two or three of them, and they each hold some sort of uh, unique power, you know, in, in, in the startup. One's a technologist, one's a salesperson or whatnot. I think that helps a lot. So I look for teams that have known each other, um, have a good background, can work together, can support each other, and you don't have a single point of failure. One thing that I love doing is backing a band that's getting back together again. You know, that, that phrase to me is like such a powerful one. You know, you get situations where a bunch of people did something once upon a time, they ended up scattering and going off and doing other things. And then a few years later, they decide, you know, just like all the best, um, you know, bank heist movies, they decide that they've got to do one last job um, and they get back together again. And there's a beautiful chemistry with people like that. They know what each other does. They can finish off each other's sentences. They trust each other implicitly. And all of that is very powerful. Bands that get back together though. So ABBA. I mean, that's one, right? <laughs> 50 years later. <laughs> no, I agree. I just, I have this incredible company of mine that went through several pivots and the front and center of their fundraising narrative, they made like, we've been best friends for 16 years and we've been through all of that together and we stayed together. And um, to me, it was really powerful. Um, and I would definitely bet on the team that gets together given that complex history. Uh, the fact that you just met each other it could be fine, you might get an investment, but let's not make it a big part of your pitch. It's not a strength. Number seven, this will be a quick flip. We'll have sold the company within two years. What we're looking for is people who want to build something really large and really enduring. Um, and so it, when someone comes to you and in that first half an hour tells you that they're not going to do that and that really this is all about um, trying to find a quick exit uh, and make some quick cash, it's just not that exciting. It's not that we won't make money. It's, it's not that I don't believe you. Um, I mean, sometimes I don't because it's actually quite hard to do that kind of thing. But even if someone can, and even if I really believe it's possible that you could build a business that could be sold in a couple of years time, um, it's just not going to make the venture capital business model work. Um, and if it doesn't work, then, then we can't invest. You should think about building a market. You should think about making as much revenue as possible and giving yourself as many options as possible because your idea of selling something in a year may not be true. And then you're stuck with something else, which could be, oh, I've got to sit down and build a business. So it's how do you build a sustainable business long term to give yourself as many options as possible? So I think anybody that wants to sell fast is completely naive about how the world works. When you think about m and activities among startups and larger enterprises, it dies down because the multiple, the revenue multiple that are applied to startups that are raising capital recently, like not a single company in a you know, functioning mind will acquire that asset. Uh, because it's tough like a, like a turkey at the moment. So I do think that expecting that the company will be sold to anyone if you raise money as like skyrocketing multiple is pretty naive. If you build a healthy business, you have options. And then you can, you know, sure, you may be able to flip it or you may do 10 other things with it. Um, also, kudos to Olga for doing the Thanksgiving reference. That was very Yeah, funny. I was like, <laughs> perfect month. <laughs> It's actually really hard and really risky to build something for a quick sale. 
What if you build it for that and it doesn't happen? Now you've built something that nobody wants. You should always try and build an amazing, sustainable business and the rest will come. Number six, we're closing the round next week and have a lot of interest from other investors. Hmm, do we really want to create a pressure cooker here? Let's see what the investors say. Yeah, I mean, uh, good for you. I mean, now it's harder because the time lines, time frames of fundraising are getting very compressed. But for me, fundraising is a marathon, not a not a sprint. In general, artificially created sense of urgency is a major turn off for me, especially if it happens before the first meeting. Uh, I hate feeling, you know, being part of a rapid transaction. And the way I think about it is that I'd love to be considered for a lifelong relationships, not for a one night stand. I'm personally a um, high conviction but low frequency investor. You know, I, I would I would much rather miss something. Uh, but then take the time to get to know someone and a business and a market really, really well. I think it will make me a much better investor and partner for you in the long run as a founder, because it means that I really know what I'm doing and I'm, I know what I'm getting into. You know, people talk about doing deals. They talk about trades. They talk about, you know, um, uh, transactions. And, and, and as I would have said, those words just don't, you know, they, they just don't appeal to me. When someone comes along and says, look, you've got, you know, X days to decide, you know, do you do it or not? I, I tend to walk away. I guess not. They don't like it much. This is also very much about timing. Having some sense of urgency when you're closing the investment is fine, but it shouldn't be a part of the initial conversation. Number five, you need to sign an NDA. Let's keep this simple. Investors almost never sign NDAs, and they have really good reasons not to. Is this idea really that genius that everybody needs to sign an NDA? So I have written an entire blog post, which is actually the most read blog post on my medium about why we don't sign NDAs. Um, so, uh, you know, I, this is a sort of pet peeve of mine. Um, it just doesn't work having, you know, what you think is a clever idea. First of all, there will be a whole bunch of other people who have the same idea. I sort of guarantee it, especially in our market and, and the technology industry right now, where so many of the smartest people on the planet today are, in, are involved in, in what we're doing and what this, tech, what this market's doing. Um, and secondly, really, the winners are almost always defined by the people who go the distance and who put the work in and who build the right team and, and do all of those things. Um, so, so I think the idea that you know this idea that you have an idea at an early stage that is the the difference between success or failure is is a pretty naive starting point. It's a waste of time. You know, I think it just gets in the way of of you raising a great round for your company. To me, it goes to a couple points. First is trust. I think that the moment you encourage an investor to sign an NDA from the get go that indicates a lack of trust and that might be problematic uh, in terms of building the working relationships. And with the team element, I think if you really think that somebody can easily steal your idea and replicate that, that probably maybe the team is not that valuable. Maybe you're not the best people in the world to build this kind of application. And if it's true, so maybe I should not be considering the investing in the startup in the first place. Number four, the product can sell itself. We don't need a sales team. You know, if, if you have a super product and you get adoption from the grounds up. I mean, that's great, right? A PLG is, is where it's at. You got to have that. You got to build that. But it doesn't stop there. And, and there's no way that you can get the big numbers and the big deals, specifically if it's like an enterprise application. If you don't have a sales team in place, the thing will not grow inside those big enterprises. It just won't. And I recently had this amazing company um, and I was talking to the CEO and um, they've been sort of um, positive on cash since 2017. And, uh, I said to him, I said, okay, cool. What, what, so what's your revenue now? And he told me, and I said, really? I said, that's, that's amazing. I said, if you had started with a sales team back in 2017, you'd probably have about a half a billion dollars right now. And he goes, that's, that's crazy. How? And I go, well, this is how I said, you have about 5,000 customers out of like, you know, the top companies in the world and your biggest contracts, like $80,000. I said, can you imagine how much gold is sitting there for your sales team to go and talk to these companies and find those advocates inside the, those companies to grow your install base? Because PLG just doesn't have advocates that grow big contracts. They just don't. And he'll get there, but it's going to take 10 years. Uh, I think the, the idea that um, a company doesn't need a sales team is, uh, is, is, is one of the um, symptoms of the kind of very engineering-centric world that we currently live in, in, in technology. Um, and I say that as a computer scientist and former software engineer, right? So I, I love the fact that, that geeks like me are important, finally. Um, but um, on the flip side, I think there's such a mythos around how it's all about, you know, the technology and the product and, and everything else, you know, sales and marketing in particular is, is dumb and stupid and a waste of time and, and wishy-washy and all the rest of it. And, and, you know, if as a founder, you think this, what I would do 
is just say, look, think about the companies that you really respect, because there presumably are some, and you will find that they all have sales teams. And they may not talk about it very much. They may talk more about their tech. They may put their engineers on the pedestal and not so much their salespeople. But trust me, they all have salespeople too. Um, and those people are critical in their success. Yes, you will need a sales team. Even if you have product-led growth, to maximize that potential, you will need a sales team. Number three, we just need your money and we're ready to go. This is about resourcefulness. I don't care. Just build something. You need a plan B. You can never wait for a specific investor. Investors love founders that are resourceful. The opposite is a total turnoff. Yeah, I think um, being an entrepreneur is all about being resourceful. Um, and if you are basically saying, I cannot do anything without your money, you're not being very resourceful. Oh. Um, of course, you can do it faster. You can do it easier. You can do it better with my money. Um, I get that. But if you're saying, oh, it's just impossible for me to get out of, you know, get out of bed without, you know, you writing me a check, then, yeah, I mean, that really questions to me how how desperate you are to do this thing. That's a that's a pretty big turn off immediately if uh, if someone said that in their in their early conversation with me. Two guys from Switzerland <laughs> yes. contacted me via LinkedIn and asked me for advice. And I said, yeah, why not? I mean, come on. They seemed okay. They're mathematicians. You know, I'll spend 10 minutes with them. I'll spend an hour with them. I said, where are you? And they go, Mexico. I go, why are you in Mexico? Well, we can't fly in the US, you know, because they got that band. But if we come to Mexico, we think we can fly in to the to United States. Uh, and we can get in that way. And they did. And then they went to San Francisco. And then they sat in San Francisco for three weeks and, and they raised 800K. And I know this because I know who they raised it from. All, all angels, all like, you know, like three or four, five, six people, including myself after I heard about this. <laughs> and I'm like, how did you guys do this? And they go, well, we would just go to like certain WeWorks. We knew where people would be. And we started talking to people. And then those people introduced us to these people. And so there were a couple of CEOs of companies that are kind of big, big startups. You know, they're like, they're not unicorn yet, but they're really close to unicorn. Maybe one of them is a unicorn. And their CEO invested. And I know this guy. So I called him. I said, why'd you invest? And they go, because they're crazy. Because they <laughs> came in here with nothing. And they, and they snuck into the United States. And, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're showing us their tech. And their tech looks great. And their idea is great. But look at them. I mean, wouldn't you invest in somebody like this? That's amazing, right? The resourcefulness that these young kids, probably in their early 20s, showed. Mathematicians too, just to get it going. It's pretty amazing. The point is there's always something you can do. And, and you may not be technical, so you may not be able to build a product, but you can pull together some kind of prototype or you can put together a video or you can do a survey or you go talk to customers or whatever it might be. And I think it's, again, it goes back to resourcefulness. Um, the best founders do something out of what they have, whatever that is. And I think that it's not about the traction you've actually achieved. It's about the fact that you decided you were going to do something, whatever that was, and the fact that you're showing this process of thinking about that and measuring the feedback, and that's you being used by you to iterate on how you build your product and your company. Uh, if you're not willing to do those things, I would sort of question whether you really have the energy to be a to be a founder that's of a successful company. We're getting to the top. Number two, we have no competition. When a founder says there's no competition, it's usually one of two things, and none of them are very good. First, no competition very often means no market. If nobody else finds this market attractive, maybe there is no market. It could also be there is competition and the founder just doesn't get it. Either way, it's not good. Any market will either have competition or get competition. Otherwise, it's pretty unlikely it's a great market. Yeah, I think, um, I think when someone says that they have no competition, um, I'm always slightly nervous because on the one hand, you want founders to be you know, fearless and ambitious. But you also want them to have a, just a slight edge of paranoia, right? I mean, the paranoid survive and all of that. Um, and if someone says, I have no competition, it always makes me think, are you really thinking in a paranoid enough way about, if, you know, if there really isn't competition now, there will be in the future, right? If, if what you're doing is valuable and interesting. So it would be, it, it's always good to find someone who's thinking around corners. And, and, you know, a very flippant, there's no competition makes me worry that you're not that kind of person. Yes, this is it. We're at the top. Number one anything that isn't true. Yes, we will pitch hard and we will exaggerate about the future, but we can never say something that isn't true. It will be found and the trust will be lost. And you can never lose your trust with your investors. I think I want founders to believe that what they're creating is unique, solves a compelling age old problem. You know, it might not, like I said, have a name to it, but they know this is going to be big and they have these visions of where it could go. That's all good. But when you go to the market and you tell somebody, yeah, we do that now, and you know they don't do that now, you know. As, you know, I, I can't go into it because you'll figure out which company I'm talking about. But, no, no, I know. And then, and then all of a sudden you're does like, it, does it involve blood testing? Of some, of some no, <laughs> no. But but I use that example. But I, I mean, that's obviously so well known because of books and documentaries. But I use that example. 
I go, it feels like this because we're talking to customers about something that simply doesn't exist. And they're making decisions based upon those statements that this currently exists when it simply doesn't. So it, it, um, it was just sad. And I was so shocked. Yeah, but it's going to do this in the future. And I'm like, fine, let's say that. Yeah, let's not say it does it today. I think as Olga said earlier that, that trust is really important between a company and, and investors. And I think that's what this is all about, right? So of course, totally. Silicon Valley and the technology industry you know, involves to some extent selling slightly ahead of where you really are. Um, and, and, you know, we call that ambition, right? And we call it aspiration. And that's a good thing. Um, but I think we all know when that, when that goes beyond an acceptable level and becomes something which, if it were exposed, you know, would, um, you know, uh, undermine the confidence the other person has in you. And, and I really think, you know, while it's one of those things, it's, it's a bit like what, whatever it was that someone said about, about um, pornography, right? I can't exactly define it, but when I see it, I know it. And um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things, I think, that people do know when they've gone too far. And what you're doing if you go too far is you're undermining trust between you and your investor. And that's yeah. a really fragile but really important thing because today you might think it's worth sacrificing that trust in order to get their dollar. But later there'll be some other situation when they won't trust you anymore because of what happened. Um, and that will come and bite you. So, you know, honestly, I, I really think it's important that people take that really seriously. What Sarangi just said is incredibly important. Don't lose the trust. It's really hard to win it again. And you will need your investors in your corner later. So don't lose the trust. Finally, I want to hear what you have to say. Put it in the comments. What have you said? What have you heard that made investors run away? If you want more content just like this, please consider pressing like and subscribe so you won't miss any future videos. Thank you very much for watching Raw Startup. Now stop watching and go build something. <laughs>